Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 30. Before we look at that passage, I'd like to start off with a few questions. Sometimes the listeners have questions for the speaker. I want to turn the table on you this morning. But seriously, you find sometimes when you're troubled that it's difficult to pray. When you try to talk to God, are there times when you don't know what to say or what to ask for? Perhaps there's times when you're so troubled that all that you can manage to say to God is help me. Perhaps when you're so overwhelmed by circumstances, and I think most of us experience that at times, uh, you wonder in your own mind what God is doing to you. Perhaps there's times that you've asked him or even wondered why God is allowing whatever it is that you're going through, whatever difficult time that it is that you're going through, to happen to you. And you cry out, why me, Lord? If you've answered yes to any of those questions this morning, and I think most of us have found ourselves in that situation to some degree before, if you've asked those questions, and if you've answered yes to any of the questions that I've just raised this morning, then this passage that we're going to look at this morning is indeed for you. In fact, this passage is for every Christian. It's a key to Christian living. Every Christian needs to understand Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 30. Let's take the time to read those verses now. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that we live in a place where we have the liberty to gather the way that we have this morning and to worship you, to pray to you, to fellowship with one another as members of your family. And Father, to to be able to sit under the teaching of your word. Father, we thank you even more so for the liberty that we have in Christ, that we've been set free from sin's bondage and that now we have been liberated to serve in Christ, the true, almighty, and powerful God. Father, we thank you for this privilege that we have of serving you. We just trust now that as we look into your word, that your spirit will guide us and will be our teacher. Father, we just trust that if there are things that are said of the flesh, that they'll be forgotten. And those things that our minds are drawn to, that are of the spirit and are your truth, that they will resonate in our minds, not only today, but in the days and months and years to come. And these things we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever heard someone perhaps say this phrase that's up on the screen, God knows what's happening? Have you ever heard somebody say that in vain? I have. Perhaps it's happened at work. Perhaps in your neighborhood. Perhaps in your own house. Perhaps you've said it yourself. Perhaps it's been a colleague that you've worked with has been working on a project or some job and things have gone very, very bad and they become frustrated and it's beyond their strength and their power to do anything about it. And you've inquired, what's wrong? And they've said, God knows what's happening. Have you ever said that? I've heard it said. It's interesting, even although in saying it in that way is really using God's name in vain, there's a truth that's contained in that statement. Because God does know what's happening. The Word of God tells us that He knows everything because He's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's everywhere. 
He's omnipresent. There's nothing that escapes his attention, nothing that he doesn't know about, even before it happens. That's how great our God is. You'll remember last week that we were looking at verses 18 to 25, that we saw how the creation is likened to a woman that is in labor and expecting a child. We see in verse 19 that it says it's, for the, it's the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. And in verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. We know that because of Adam's sin, and we looked at this last week, that not only the human race, not only Adam's race has been plunged into a corrupted state where sin and suffering, and pain, and illness, and aging, and death exist. But that those things have also come into the rest of the creation, and we looked at a bit of that last week. How this creation is is characterized by those things. And the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, likened that to a woman in her labor pains. But of course, this analogy is a beautiful one, because a woman that is in labor looks forward to the end of that time of toil and that time of pain, to a time when something very wonderful is going to be revealed. And that's what the scriptures say here. That's what we've been looking at, that it's the earnest expectation of the creation, eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. And that's talking about those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the glory which shall be revealed in us. That aspect of our salvation, that the time is coming when we are going to be changed into the likeness of Christ. And we're going to look at that a little bit more this morning. But we live in this present time, and that is still future. It could happen at any time. We know that we have that earnest expectation that Christ is is going to return with a shout, and that we're going to be caught up in the air together with him, and we're going to be changed into his likeness because we're going to see him as he is. And that could happen at any time. But in the intervening time, we know that our life is also characterized by birth pangs, so to speak. That we do experience a measure of sorrow, of toil, and of pain. And some people have more of it, and some people have less of it. But God has done something very special for those of us who are in Christ, those of us that have put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us his Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit has taken up residence in us. And that Spirit is described as a helper, as a comforter. This was something that the Lord Jesus Christ promised to his followers, his disciples in John chapter 14, that this comforter would be very much part of their life and would be with them. And this is something that we see in verses 26 and 27, is that God is, is always with us. We are assured of that. That His Spirit is in us. And that the Spirit communicates our unspoken thoughts, emotions, and needs to our Heavenly Father. And does so perfectly. And does so perfectly. And finally, the Spirit that lives in us knows our true needs. There's times we're not sure what we need. There's times we think we know what we need. And we ask God for it. Or as I said before, there's even times where we're not even sure what to ask for. But be assured of this, that the Holy Spirit knows our true needs even better than we do ourselves. You know, the scripture says that we are to pray without ceasing. That's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17. That we're not to give up on praying. That's something that we're told as Christians. But there are times when it's very, very difficult. I don't know about you, but there's times when it just feels like you can't get it out. You don't know what to say. You're not sure what God is doing. You're not sure how you're going to be delivered from whatever struggle it is that you're in. And we have this assurance that God knows us perfectly from the inside out. He knows exactly what's going on in the inside. And his spirit is there interceding for us and communicating those thoughts, those needs, those emotions to God. Let's read those two verses again. It says, Likewise, 
the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. As we labor and struggle, we have that picture of, of the woman in labor in mind, for we do not know what we should pray for. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And it says in verse 23 that we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Are there times when you just wish that it was all over? That this life was finished and that Christ would return and he'd take us home with him to be in perfect bodies? That's perfectly natural. I believe that that's a bit of what this scripture is talking about. But in the intervening time, in verse 27, it says, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. God searches our heart. His Spirit is there in our inner being and in our mind and in our heart. And that Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Interesting thing. That there's times we desire to know what God's will is and we're faced with decisions in our life and we're not sure what the right decision to make is and we're quite troubled. God, of course, knows what His will is. The Holy Spirit, as the third person of, of the Godhead, knows exactly what God's will is. And the Scripture assures us that in times, difficult times, and I believe that's what's in, in view here as we have this picture of the woman in labor. And as part of the creation, that picture applies to us too as we live in a creation that wrestles with the effects and consequences of sin. But that the Holy Spirit is there with us, interceding at every moment according to the will of God. God knows what's best for us. He knows what's necessary in order for Him to accomplish His will in us. And His Spirit is right there in each of us who believe. This is a tremendous comfort that we have. <clears throat> Verse 28 now tells us that everything that God is doing, everything that is allowed into our life, that it's all good. This is not something that we see in our own humanity. We come across many circumstances that we wish those circumstances weren't part of our life. And I, sus I suppose that probably every woman that's ever had a child would gladly surrender the labor pains for the prize that comes at the end. But it can't be done. It can't be done. We would gladly have the difficult times disappear from our life, but verse 28 tells us that they're all good, that God is using them to accomplish his purpose. You know, there's times when we're a bit like Job. It takes some time to to read the book of Job, 40 some odd chapters and lots of conversations going on with Job and his friends and so on and so forth and perhaps even a bit difficult to follow at times. But you know, Job was plagued with many trials. We often hear about the patience of Job. And he was accused by his friends of being a secret sinner, that it was some direct result of sin that God was plaguing him with whatever this trouble was that was upon him. We of course know that that, that wasn't the case. In fact, there was a, a spiritual challenge that had gone on in the backdrop that Satan had challenged God concerning Job. And God chose to glorify it by himself in the trials of Job. Job didn't know that. And Job wondered what on earth was going on. What was God doing to him? And in places in Job, uh, his attitude was tantamount to him demanding an explanation from God. He called out on God and demanded that God give him an explanation of what it was that he was doing. And you know, we can be a bit like that too. There's times when difficult challenges and trials and tribulations come upon us. And we can wonder and doubt whether God really knows what he's doing. Or whether perhaps God has turned his back on us. Or set his face against us for some reason. That whatever blessing that we had in Christ that perhaps has been lost. And we wonder, what is going on? What is it that God is doing? But this is something, too, that we can be perfectly sure about based on what the Word of God says. That God knows exactly what He's doing. He's never out of control. He never has any of those 
whatever you want to call them, 40 moments or whatever. I have more and more of those now. Pretty soon I'll be having 50s moments. God's not like that. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he never makes mistakes. He never makes mistakes. And this verse, verse 28, let's read it again. Most of you that have known me for some time know this is one of my favorite verses in the Scripture. And it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. You've heard me paraphrase it before, and I'll do it again. This Scripture says that everything that happens to you, every circumstance, every moment, and every single thing that happens to you in your life, it's all good from God's perspective. He's using all of it to accomplish a purpose, and He knows exactly what He's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. Do you believe it? This is a test of the Christian faith. You ought to believe it because God's word says it in black and white. That everything that's happening to you, God is using to accomplish his purpose. As they say in the the modern vernacular, it's all good. We need to have have that attitude. It brings us then to this question of what God is doing. So what is God doing? What is his purpose? What is God doing to me? And those those questions are good questions to ask because God wants you to know what it is that he's doing in you as a believer. He's revealed it to us in in his word and it's right here in this passage. Sadly, there are many Christians that don't understand that, understand what's in this passage and are quite bewildered by some of the circumstances that are in their life. Of course, one of the first things that we understand as a Christian is that it's God's purpose for us to be justified. He desires for us to have our sins forgiven. And we've been looking at this in the book of Romans. There's been a tremendous progression as we've been studying in the book of Romans. And we're climbing a mountaintop, and we're almost at the top of it now. As a matter of fact, we're getting very close to the peak, which many would say is in Romans chapter 8. But we saw as we started in this book that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, as we, as we looked in the first two and a half chapters. And midway through chapter 3, this idea of justification, of how our sins can be forgiven, how they have been forgiven in Jesus Christ by his bloodshed on the cross, that that's part of God's purpose for the believer. But it just starts there, right? There's more. We read as we got into into chapters 5 and 6 and 7 that we're also sanctified, that Jesus Christ not only purchased for me the forgiveness of my sins at Calvary's cross, but he also won victory over the power that sin has in my life. Because I'm part of Adam's race, I have a sinful nature. When I was a child, I didn't have to be taught how to sin, I didn't have to be taught how to disobey my parents. I did it quite naturally because it's part of my nature. I'm part of Adam's race. I'm a slave to sin naturally because I'm born of Adam's race. But Christ, when he went to the cross, he went there as the last Adam. And he put an end to sin. And the scripture says that he set us free from sin's power and we've been raised up together with him in newness of life and we serve a new master now because we've died to sin And we're alive to Christ. But there's even more. There's even more to God's purpose. And this is what we've been looking at in Romans chapter 8. That it's God's purpose for us not only to have our sins forgiven, not only for, for us to be rescued and freed from sin's power, but it is God's purpose for us to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. It says in verse 29, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. You see, the Scriptures teach us that we are destined for sinless perfection. That's where we're headed. And it's not something that I'm accomplishing by my own efforts. It's something that God is accomplishing in me through Christ. That Jesus Christ made it all possible at Calvary's cross. Possible for me to have my sins forgiven. Possible for me to be rescued from sin's power. And possible for me to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. And there's at least two aspects to that. That I am being conformed and I will ultimately be conformed 
to the, to the likeness of Christ's character. You remember recently we did a study in the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Those are the joy, His peace, His patience, His kindness, His goodness, His faithfulness, His meekness, and self-control. And we have a measure of that now. We have the first fruits of the Spirit as the Spirit works in us to cultivate these characters. But the time is going to come when the work is going to be complete. It says in Philippians chapter 1 that He who began a good work in you will complete it at the day of Christ Jesus. The day is going to come when we're going to meet Christ face to face and the work will be finished and we will be like Christ in all of these, all of these characters. But it's not only in character that we are destined for sinless perfection, but in our bodies as well. These bodies are racked by sin. They're corrupted by sin. And the day is going to come, the Scriptures teach us, when we're going to cast off this old heavenly tent and we're going to get a new heavenly habitation, a new body that is going to be incorruptible. We'll have a body where there's no suffering, there's no pain, there's no illness. There's no aging. And a body that cannot die. This is the body that Jesus Christ was raised in. This is the body that he was raised in. He is the firstborn among many brethren. He is the first to get that immortal, incorruptible body that is not characteristic of Adam's race. It's characteristic of the second man. Adam was the first man. He was made of the earth. But the second man, Christ, has come from heaven. And he dwells now in an immortal, incorruptible body. And the scriptures say he is the firstborn among many brethren. That the day is going to come and we're going to get a body like his too. And we're going to be like him. We're going to see him as he is. We're going to see him in that immortal body, it says in 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to, like, we're going to be like him. We're going to get that same, that same body. <clears throat> We read in this verse uh, 28 about God's purpose. And there's a progression of words here as we go through verses 28, 29, and 30. There are key words. Purpose, foreknew, predestined, called, justified, glorified. And I'd like to spend the time that we have remaining in looking at those key words because there's a progression there. And this ought to give us comfort and confidence that indeed God knows what he's doing and that he's going to get what he set out to get right from the very beginning of time and that everything that's going on in our lives is working to accomplish that purpose. And when we can understand that, and more importantly than even understanding it, believe it and trust in it, it's going to change your life. It's going to change the way that you look at some of the stuff that goes on in your life, in particular some of the difficult and challenging uh, times. You see, God had a purpose from the beginning of time. He desired and he set out to have a perfect relationship with perfect beings that was fashioned after the, the relationship that he has with his son. He has a perfect relationship. God has a perfect relationship with himself, so to speak. Between the first and second person of the Godhead, there is a flawless and perf perfect relationship between him and his son, the father and the son. And God had a purpose from before the foundations of the earth, before time and space and matter even existed, and all there was was God himself, that he had a purpose. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, have a, I'm going to create a race of beings that I'm going to have a relationship with, and it's going to be like the relationship that I have with my son. And God has foreknowledge. He knows everything, and he is all-powerful. And once he had determined that, that purpose, he knew that it would be, that the, he knew what the ultimate outcome would be, that he would have what he purposed to get. Because he's God. Nothing could stop him. All-powerful and almighty. Nothing could thwart this purpose. Even sin itself cannot thwart this purpose. He knew from the very beginning what he would ultimately have. And then he determined beforehand that he would get it. And this is what predestination is. That he determined beforehand that those who would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he marked them out before time, even before the creation itself was made, and said, 
they will be conformed to the likeness of his Son. <clears throat> and so we have his purpose in eternity past. His knowledge that this would be accomplished according to his will. And him determining beforehand that those who were chosen in Christ would be conformed to the likeness of his Son. And then we see this word comes up in a couple of places about those who are called. Did you notice it in verse 28? That we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And in verse 30 it says, Moreover, whom he predestined or chose from before the foundations of the earth, determined beforehand, those he predestined he also called. Interesting. You see, God had a plan from before the foundations of the earth. And he set the creation in motion. There was a great event, a tragic event that happened in the Garden of Eden where the whole creation was plunged into sin. But that's not going to stop God. He knew that would happen. And he knew beforehand that his son would have to die in order to redeem the creation. And he has determined beforehand that any that would put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, this purpose would be accomplished in them. And the question of the ages is this. You're being invited by God to make his will yours. God's will doesn't change. God purposed these things from before the foundations of the earth. That you'd have your sins forgiven that you'd be delivered from sin's power, and you'd be delivered from all the consequences of sin, the effects that it has on your personality and your character and even your body. And now the question of the ages is, do you want his will to be yours? That's what the gospel invitation is. God wants you to have your sins forgiven. Do you want your sins forgiven? He's made provision for that. God wants to rescue you from the awful power that sin has over you. Do you want that? And God wants you to conform you to the likeness of his Son. You are called, you are invited to make his will yours. And it's as simple as that if you say, yes, God, I'm a sinner. I want my sins forgiven. I want to be delivered from myself, this nature that I have where I naturally sin. And I want to look forward to one day meeting you face to face in the person of Jesus Christ and being delivered from this sin rack creation in this old body that I have. That's what we are called to. It says, those he called, he also justified. And really, as we've gone through the book of Romans, what we've seen is that justification is really like the starting point of our salvation, isn't it? For many of us, most of us, it's the thing that we're preoccupied with when we first put our trust in Jesus Christ, naturally. Naturally we learn that if we die in our sins and we don't have our sins forgiven, that we're headed for an eternity separated from God. And in fact, what would happen is that as a result of us not conforming our will to His, not answering the call and taking up His invitation to have His purpose accomplished in us, that's what we do, is we would basically then be sent to a Christless eternity. And that, there's a certain fear that's associated with that that God is going to separate himself from me. This separation that I have from him now because of my sins, that it's going to continue on into eternity. And there's a desire that's cultivated in us by the work of the Holy Spirit that I want to have my sins forgiven. That's something that, that's, that's really, in many ways, the starting point of our salvation, isn't it? But there's more to it than that. And after we, we hear the gospel, that in Jesus Christ and by trusting in his blood shed, on the cross, that I can have my sins forgiven. And we begin to now, as a believer, study more about Christ and, and how much he really did at Calvary's cross. I begin to see the whole magnitude of it. That there's more that comes with the package than just having my sins forgiven. There's more than, than just dying and going to heaven. Okay? There's a lot that, that want to go to heaven when they die. But sadly, many are unwilling to accept Christ. Many are unwilling to conform their will to the will of God, that it's through Jesus Christ that his purpose would be uh, accomplished in them. And so justification is the starting point of our salvation. And we see this here. It says, Moreover, whom he predestined, 
These he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified. And then it says, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. You see, our glorification will be the culmination or the completion of our salvation. It's not that it's in doubt. It's a done deal. It's a sure thing that will occur. The scriptures teach us that the Holy Spirit is a seal that has been placed upon us by the King himself, the King of Kings. And he has sealed us unto that day when we will be glorified. And on that day, we will then realize or experience all of the benefits of what Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary's cross. And there's a marvelous thing as we look in this, this verse. Have you noticed it? Have you noticed the tenses of the verbs? Look at the way it's worded. It says, Moreover, whom he predestined, past tense, these he called, past tense, and whom he called, past tense, these he also justified, past tense. Now, if you're a believer, you can relate to that. You can remember when you first put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and your sins were forgiven. That's past tense. But now look at the way it continues. And it says, In whom he justified, these he also glorified. Past tense again. Interesting, isn't it? Because we look forward to that as something future. A time is going to come when I'm going to see him face to face and I'm going to be changed into his likeness. And we typically would not use a past tense verb in describing our glorification. But God does. You see? Why? Because it's done. In his mind. It's done. God stands outside of time. He made time itself. The very first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in scientific terms, what that means is that God created by the power of his word, the space, time, matter, continuum. Those three things. Time itself didn't even exist. And he stands outside all of that. And he sees it all from the beginning to the end. This is why it says that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He sees it all. God sees it all. And from his perspective, as he looks to his right hand and sees his son Jesus Christ seated at his right hand and us seated there with him, because that's where we are, we're positioned in him, it's a done deal. It's finished. It's complete. When was it completed? Well, it was done at Calvary's cross. That's where we were glorified. Just as we were sanctified there and we were justified there, it was all been made possible because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. My hope is that as we've looked at this this morning, that this is something that encourages us. That as we look at this, we get this picture in our mind. We've been looking at this... uh, uh, picture of the the woman who is in labor, but she looks forward to the delivery of her baby and something marvelous, a a marvelous new revelation, a revealing of, of of a new child and that pain and that labor passing. And there's a tremendous picture there for us as well as we consider ourselves as part of that creation which is in birth pangs and has been for century and millennia. But it's going to come to an end. And those birth pangs, the troubles that we face in this Christian life, you know, that's part of us being identified with Jesus Christ. It goes right back to verse 17. It says that since we are children, we're also heirs, and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, since indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. In our natural human state, when we face difficult times, whether it's physical pain or mental pain, and often the two come together, we don't naturally think of those things as being good things. But think of that woman that's in labor. That when she is laboring and she's experiencing that pain, she's looking to the end of it. She's looking at what that pain and that toil is going to accomplish. And uh, I don't profess to have ever, I'll never experience that, but I know it's something that I've talked to my wife about and and other other women, I've heard them talk about this, that the prize that's won at the end of it all 
far outweighs the difficulty that they went through. And this is how it started off last week when we looked at verse 18, when Paul said, again, God tells us, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And God has given us this passage as we've been climbing this mountain in in the book of Romans. And we've now reached the pinnacle of our salvation when we see ultimately what God's purpose is. And we realize that, yes, I know the suffering is real. I've experienced it. But we now are taught and we realize that God's Spirit is there with us through it all. He understands it all. That we can never say truthfully that God doesn't understand what I'm going through. He understands it perfectly. We need to believe that. And we need to trust that whatever situation that we're in, that the Holy Spirit is communicating our situation to God and God understands it perfectly. And that ultimately we are in God's will because he has a purpose for us. And every single thing that happens to us, God is using to accomplish that purpose. That the, 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 the suffering that I'm going through now points me to the ultimate culmination of my salvation, which is my glorification. And I believe that when we see this, and more importantly, when we believe it, that it can change your life. It can change your life. Oh, the suffering and the pain won't go away. But there can be a new um, attitude towards it. And... uh, the old attitude, which was, why are you allowing this to happen to me, God? And what are you doing? Do you really know what's happen- happening to me? And nobody understands. And those are all human emotions that we have. That that can be transformed into a quiet confidence, peace, and joy that God knows exactly what he's doing. And he's using these things to make me more like Christ. Don't you see that that without those things, there would be some characters of Christ that could not be cultivated in us? My mother used to say to me, she'd say, Mark, be careful, when I was younger. Don't pray for patience, because if you do, God's going to send trials into your life. And it's like the bodybuilder. If the bodybuilder wants to build up his biceps or his triceps or whatever, then he has to do certain exercises with certain weights in order to make that happen. And there's a certain amount of pain that's involved in that in order for the the muscles to grow. And it's like that for us as well. That if I'm going to grow in the patience of Christ, well, then my patient's muscle is going to have to be tried and it's going to have to be flexed. And if I'm going to grow in the long-suffering and endurance of the Lord Jesus Christ, then that muscle is going to need to be flexed as well. You see, that's one of the reasons why God has given Christian parents children. (laughs) Yeah, I do believe that. I do believe that. They are a tremendous gift and a tremendous joy, but God uses all of our circumstances in order to grow us in 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 the character of Christ, and we know that ultimately we're going to be delivered into this glorious liberty of the children of God where we're going to to see him like he is and we're going to be, be exactly like him. I trust that this has been an encouragement to you. It certainly has been to me as I've been, uh, been reading through this and reminded of some of these things. I think it would be nice for us to, uh, to close with a, with a hymn this morning. So let's, uh, let's do that.